Welcome to the Cat Cannabis Show here on New Earth TV. Please check out and like the show Facebook page by the same name, where tonight's show will be posted along with the Spreaker radio link. The show is actually live right now on the Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis Facebook page. And our uh, producer, Rachel, may actually be sending me your questions from Facebook. So if you've got any for our guests tonight, don't be shy. Just type them in. And I'm your host, Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis, author of the Amazon bestseller in pre-publication slated for an April 17th release, Dreams That Can Save Your Life, written with Dr. Larry Burke, a radiologist at Duke University. And as a dream expert, my waking world is all about dreams. And you did send me a dream this week. Someone wanted to know what it meant when their teeth fall out in a dream. I've had that. I've had recurrent dreams like that too. And it can mean a number of different things. It can mean that you're feeling insecure about something. You can't quite get a bite on life concerning something. It could also mean that you're losing your baby teeth in life and you're going to get your new adult teeth. So look back and see what's going on. You're obviously stressed, but it may be a good stress. So don't stress over the stress. Our guest tonight is a giant Boris, Boreas, and I'm going to have him tell you his name again because I know I just butchered it again. He is the author of Whispers of the Himalaya, and it's an exciting true story about his journey to the Ganga High in the Himalayas where he meditated in a cave for two months in silence. Uh, but this was no ordinary retreat. Uh, he, he created these unexpected friendships with holy men. He encountered madmen. He encountered the Indian army, and he survived the harsh mountain conditions, including scorpions and mind-numbing cold. And what, this hap what, what happened was this opened him to the depths of human spirit, and to universal insights and the whispers of the Himalayans. Welcome to the show, Ajayan Boris. Boris? That's very <laughs> close, Kat. Hey, thank you so much for having me here. It's Ajayan Boris. So, not bad. Good Great. <laughs> I, I didn't do it too badly. Not at all. Okay. Ajayan, I, I just, you know, when I was reading this, I was like, O M. G. <laughs> yeah. So tell us first, the Mad Men. Tell us about the Mad Men you encountered and where you encountered them. And well, what you did. Okay, so uh, this is kind of interesting. I mean, that came later in the book, as you know. Um, uh, one day I was just sitting at this cafe. I usually didn't even go to a cafe, but for some reason this day I did. And, and I saw this uh, fellow, uh, a Westerner, in orange robes in a distance and he was buying something from a shop and uh, somehow we caught each other's eyes and after he left the shop he came over and the thing was I wasn't speaking I had taken kind of a vow of silence for these two months so I wasn't speaking so he uh, came over to me and started kind of on a tirade about the cost of the cookies that he just bought and uh yeah and so when he saw that i didn't respond and i gave him my little uh mime signal that i was not speaking which was just like you know marcel musa whatever his name was you know marcel, just zipping, marcel, yeah yeah that's the fellow uh, i just zipped my lips shut and then he got it and he says oh well do you mind if i talk to you and then he went into this monologue that was truly amazing about how uh, he loved to be there, which is great, um, but he was aspiring to uh, reducing first his food intake to the point where he just wanted to survive on pine needles, and uh, he felt they, he had tasted them, and he felt they had a lot of promise, and uh, then he um, was going to uh, reduce his sleep to nil. And he also made the interesting point that if he was going to survive the winters here, he would have to uh, make do with uh, less clothing. He would have to reduce his clothing to nil and be able to survive 
naked in the winters. So his logic kind of threw me, to be honest. <laughs> and he went on quite a bit. There was much more to it. And, uh, and, and he was a kind of presence in the book. Um, not that I sought his company out, but, uh, you know, later in the book, I tried to help him. And, uh, and that was quite a fiasco because he ended up storing a bunch of stolen goods in my cave without telling me that were stolen. And I found out that they were stolen. And then the Indian army showed up. And so it was uh, really a crazy afternoon when I should have just been quietly meditating. <laughs> oh my but, goodness. We've heard yeah. of the vagina monologues. This was the madness monologues. <laughs> right. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that was just one small story, but it was, uh, it kind of added some levity, you know, to the being there. Um, I made a lot of friends with wonderful uh, residents there, holy men who just the sweetest uh, people that you'd ever want to meet. And uh, some just actually one guy who was living there naked and was a, a saint that people would come up and see and so on. So a lot of interesting characters in the book. And of course, that wasn't what I expected when I went there. I just wanted to... Uh, take a long retreat. I was really looking forward to it. And just to meditate and see what could happen if I just were to do nothing other than really a dedicated, you know, meditation for X amount of time. I didn't know how long I would be there. And uh, it ended up to be the adventure of a lifetime and just wonderful. And the whispers are the insights that I had. That's what I call the whispers of the Himalaya. And of course, because you really connect with the nature, especially when you're doing so many hours of meditation every day, your senses become very finely tuned, your awareness becomes very sharp and crystalline, and you're in this absolutely gorgeous environment in the Himalayas. And I was in a forest all by myself, living in a cave, um, and so a lot of privacy and solitude and time to just really connect deeply with nature. And so there, a lot of inspiration came and that's the whispers that I really wanted to share. It just so happened, there was also a lot of story that happened too. Oh, no doubt. I mean, mm -hmm. we've only been on five minutes and look at what we've covered. Um, yeah. So what possessed you to do this? What, did you just wake up one morning and say, you know what, I think I'm going to go to the Himalayas and uh, find a cave and stay there for two months, not, not speak and just meditate? Well, there's a big backstory to this, actually. Um, and I cover some of that starting in the introduction. It goes way back to when I was 18 years old and had an amazing sort of spiritual experience. This was in 1970. I was a senior in high school. And I basically just dissolved into the infinite. And shortly after that, I picked up a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, which I didn't have any exposure to Eastern thought. Bhagavad Gita is a very popular scripture in India. And I opened it up and looked at it, and it was as if I had written it. I mean, it was so familiar to me. And then I started reading some Buddhist books. And again, the same thing, they were describing my experience. And so I decided that I wanted to, actually at that point, I wanted to go to Tibet. Um, and, but it was, you know, I was a high school student and how was I going to get to Tibet? I had no money. I was supposed to enter college the next fall quarter. Uh, so, and besides the communist occupation, so what could I do? So I went to college instead and went to a lecture on meditation and, and learned to meditate. And uh, that, and then from there, I learned to teach meditation. And I just kind of uh, snowballed until I found myself a couple decades later uh, being the meditation teacher in a very big ashram in South India. Uh, and that was, maybe some of your listeners have heard of Ama or Amachi, the hugging saint. So it was her ashram in Kerala, and, uh, and I was the meditation teacher. So I was teaching uh, courses seven days a week, and there were thousands of visitors coming to this very big popular ashram. And it was really uh, quite demanding. I, it was constant people, constant noise. And it, I did that for a few years and then uh, got to a point where Amma left for, um, for a world tour. And I thought, wow, I could really use a retreat. Somebody told me about this beautiful valley at the source of the Ganges River at 10,000 feet in the Himalayas. And so I started up the full length of India uh, by train and bus and 
got to that place. So that's the backstory. Oh, what a story. And I, I, I know that you sent me uh, some information. And one of the things that popped, jumped out at me was you said how difficult it was to find caves. Mm-hmm. You would think that they'd be everywhere and you just crawl into one. So what was the difficulty? Uh, well, first off, at 10,000 feet in the Himalayas, there's a very short window that you can even be there uh, because of the weather mm-hmm. prim- primarily. So, uh, and I got up there right at the perfect time, June. And so it was reasonably warm, you know, in the 60s and 70s. And that is the high season. So holy men from all over India come there during that season. And they find every cave and hut. And it's just like, they're all full. So it's like trying to find an apartment in, in Manhattan, you might say. It's, it was really challenging. And it took me about, a, I think it was probably four or five days of searching. And even then, it was very lucky that I found a cave. I was walking through a forest one day and uh, looking for a cave. And I came to this spot that seemed very silent. And I thought, oh, this feels really good here. And so I started to go down towards the canyon overlooking the Ganga River. And as I went down this hill, went right next to a boulder, then I turned and I looked and under the boulder was a little wooden door. And so that's, that was the cave. And so they actually, these man-made caves, they dig out from underneath boulders. They take the rocks that they dig out and they pile them in the front. And then if they're really ambitious, they'll put a little door there. So, and it was empty. So that was where I stayed. Somebody had abandoned it and and you took it over. Right. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And the thing was, and I was on a very tight budget. When we moved to the ashram, we had sold everything. We actually gave a lot of it to charity and just kind of kept what we needed. We had two kids. It was my wife and I and two daughters. And we kind of kept some money for their future and medical costs and just living expenses. And, uh, and that was it. So when I went, I tried not to take any money. And I took just the bare minimum. So I really needed a free situation, something as cheap as a cave. <laughs> and that's what I got. I have to ask, I know our audience is going, his wife? What was his wife thinking? What did your wife think? Well, she was very supportive, actually, because she was living in the ashram. She had a whole community of friends and uh, people to be with. And, uh, and it was also a very busy life, lots of uh, seva or service they do. And then my two girls were just happy as larks playing with their friends. So, and it was, like I say, the summer. So it was kind of school was out and it was just a time of relaxation and play and, uh, and service. And so it wasn't, uh, it was a good time for me to go. And so they were all very supportive of it. Great. Do you have your book there? Can you hold your book up so the audience can see it? I do. Let's see. There it is. Whispers of the Himalayas. Very nice. You know, that cover is just gorgeous. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, an artist uh, did that. A wonderful artist. I really appreciated his work. And where can we find your book? Well, Amazon.com is probably the easiest. Just go to Amazon, search for Whispers of the Himalaya, and there it will be. Great. And how can our audience find you? Uh, Ajayan.com. That's A J A y-a-n uh, dot com. And if you go to my website, ajan.com, uh, you know, I teach meditation. This is what I've done since 1973. And, uh, and there's a lot of misconceptions about meditation. Uh, so I take an approach that makes it very easy and yet very deep and profound. And so uh, if you are interested in meditation, as soon as you get to my site, you'll see that you can have a free Uh, 10 minute guided meditation in the style that I teach. So click that and uh, you'll get that free guided meditation. And I'm sure that you'll enjoy it. So if you want to have 10 minutes of real peace and relaxation and and find out what deep meditation feels like, just go to ajan.com and click on the free guided 10 minute meditation. 
Ajayan, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, this has been such an eye opener. And, and I do have one last question. One last sure. question. Tell us about the scorpions. I would never imagine scorpions up in the Himalayas. Well, yes. Uh, I found this when we I moved into the cave and I was <laughs> trying to, you know, it a was roommate. Just, yeah, it was just dirt, right? You know, and so I was spreading pine needles and I found these little black scorpions. Um, and really, for the most part, they kept to themselves. I kind of flicked them out with a stick outside the cave. And after that, I just had a couple encounters with them, but never got stung. And so it, it really wasn't so bad, but it was kind of interesting that scorpions are up there. Oh, so those, you had scorpions with manners and they kind of started as roommates and they didn't seem to mind too much that you moved in. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much for being on the show. And remember, audience, uh, everyone dreams and some dreams can save lives. So remember your dreams. Until next week, have a great week. Thank you, Kat.